and here we are. Once again, 6 p.m. of a Wednesday, it's time for Tales and Cocktails. Now, this is part 10 of Jane Austen's Persuasion, and a reminder that the Elliots, well, Jane, uh, Anne Elliot has joined her father, her sister Elizabeth, and her sister's dear friend, Mrs. Clay, in Bath. Sir Walter, his two daughters, and Mrs. Clay were the earliest of all their party at the rooms in the evening, and as Lady Dalrymple must be waited for, they took their station by one of the fires in the octagon room. But hardly were they so settled when the door opened again, and Captain Wentworth walked in alone. Anne was the nearest to him, and making yet a little advance, she instantly spoke. He was preparing only to bow and pass on, but her gentle, how do you do, brought him out of the straight line to stand near her and make inquiries in return, in spite of the formidable father and sister in the background. Their being in the background was a support to Anne. She knew nothing of their looks and felt equal to everything which she believed right to be done. While they were speaking, a whispering between her father and Elizabeth caught her ear. She could not distinguish, but she must guess the subject, and on Captain Wentworth's making a distant bow, she comprehended that her father had judged so well as to give him that simple acknowledgement of, ac of acquaintance, and she was just in time by a side glance to see a slight curtsy from Elizabeth herself. This, though late and reluctant, and ungracious was yet better than nothing, and her spirits improved. After talking, however, of the weather and bath and the concert, their conversation began to flag, and so little was said at last that she was expecting him to go every moment, but he did not. He seemed in no hurry to leave her, and presently, with renewed spirit, with a little smile, a little glow, he said. I have hardly seen you since our day at Lyme. I am afraid I am afraid you must have suffered from the shock, and the more from its not overpowering you at the time. She assured him that she had not. It was a frightful time, said he, a frightful day, and he passed his hand across his eyes, as if the remembrance was still too painful. But in a moment, half smiling again, added, the day has produced some effects, however, has had some consequences which must be considered as the very reverse of frightful. When you had the presence of mind to suggest that Benwick would be the properest person to fetch a surgeon, you could have had little idea of his being eventually one of those most concerned in her recovery. Certainly I could have none, but it appears I should hope it would be a very happy match. There are on both sides good principles and good temper. Yes, said he, looking not exactly forward. But there, I think, ends the resemblance. With all my soul, I wish them happy and rejoice over every circumstance in favor of it. They have no difficulties to contend with at home, no opposition, no caprice, no delays. The Musgroves are behaving like themselves most honorably and kindly, only anxious with, with true parental hearts to promote their daughter's comfort. All this is much, very much in favor of their happiness. More than perhaps he stopped. A sudden recollection seemed to occur and to give him some taste of that emotion which was reddening Anne's cheeks and fixing her eyes on the ground. After clearing his throat, however, he proceeded thus. I confess that I do think there is a disparity, too great a disparity, and in a point no less essential than mind. I regard Louisa Musgrove as a very amiable, sweet-tempered girl, and not deficient in understanding. But Benwick is something more. He is a clever man, 
a reading man, and I confess that I do consider his attaching himself to her with some surprise. Had it been the effect of gratitude, had he learnt to love her because he believed her to be preferring him, it would have been another thing. But I have no reason to suppose it so. It seems, on the contrary, to have been a perfectly spontaneous, untaught feeling on his side, and this surprises me. A man like him, in his situation, with a heart pierced, wounded, almost broken, Fanny Harville was a very superior creature, and his attachment to her was indeed attachment. A man does not recover from such a devotion of the heart to such a woman. He ought not. He does not. Either from his consciousness, however, that his friend had recovered, or from some other consciousness, he went no farther. And Anne who in spite of the agitated voice in which the latter part had been uttered, and in spite of all the various noises of the room, the almost ceaseless slam of the door and ceaseless buzz of persons walking through, had distinguished every word, was struck, gratified, confused, and beginning to breathe very quick, and feel a hundred things in a moment. It was impossible for her to enter on such a subject and yet, after a pause, feeling the necessity of speaking and having not the smallest wish for a total change, she only deviated as far as to say, you were a great while at Lyme, I think. About a fortnight. I could not leave it till Louisa's doing well was quite ascertained. I had been too deeply conserved in the mis concerned in the mystery, mischief to be soon at peace. It had been my doing, solely mine. She would not have been obstinate if I had not been weak. The country round Lyme is very fine. I walked and rode a great deal, and the more I saw, the more I found to admire. I should very much like to see Lyme again, said Anne. Indeed. I should not have supposed that you could have found anything in Lyme to inspire such a feeling. The horror and distress you were involved in, the stretch of mind, the wear of spirits. I should have thought your last impressions of Lyme must have been strong disgust. The last few hours were certainly very painful, replied Anne. But when pain is over, the remembrance of it often becomes a pleasure. One does not love a place the less for having suffered in it, unless it has been all suffering, nothing but suffering, which is by no means the case at Lyme. We were only in anxiety and distress during the last two hours, and previously there had been a great deal of enjoyment, so much novelty and beauty. I have traveled so little, that every fresh fate place would be interesting to me. But there is real beauty at Lyme. And in short, with a faint blush at some recollections, altogether my impressions of the place are very agreeable. As she ceased, the entrance door opened again, and the very party appeared for whom they were waiting. Lady Dalrymple, Lady Dalrymple, was the rejoicing sound, and with all the eagerness compatible with anxious elegance, Sir Walter and his two ladies stepped forward to meet her. Lady Dalrymple and Miss Carteret, escorted by Mr. Elliot and Colonel Wallace, who had happened to arrive nearly at the same instant, advanced into the room. The others joined them, and it was a group in which Anne found herself also necessarily included. She was divided from Captain Wentworth. Their interesting, almost too interesting conversation must be broken up for a time. But slight was the penance compared with the happiness which brought it on. She had learnt in the last ten minutes more of his feelings toward Louisa, more of all his feelings 
than she dared to think of. And she gave herself up to the demands of the party, to the needful civilities of the moment, with exquisite, though agitated, sensations. She was in good humor with all. She had received ideas which disposed her to be courteous and kind to all, and to pity everyone as being less happy than herself. The delightful emotions were a little subdued when, on stepping back from the group to be joined again by Captain Wentworth, she saw that he was gone. She was just in time to see him turn into the concert room. He was gone. He had disappeared. She felt a moment's regret. But they should meet again. He would look for her. He would find her out long before the evening was over. And at present, perhaps, it was as well to be asunder. She was in need of a little interval for recollection. Upon Lady Russell's appearance soon afterwards, the whole party was collected and all that remained was to marshal themselves and proceed into the concert room and be of all the consequence in their power, draw as many eyes, excite as many whispers, and disturb as many people as they could. Very, very happy were both Elizabeth and Anne Elliot as they walked in. Elizabeth, arm in arm with Miss Carteret, and looking on the broad back of the dowager Viscountess who were Dalrymple before her, had nothing to wish for which did not seem within her reach. And Anne, but it would be an insult to the nature of Anne's felicity to draw any comparison between it and her sisters. The origin of one, all selfish vanity, of the other, all generous attachment. Anne saw nothing, thought nothing of the brilliancy of the room. Her happiness was from within. Her eyes were bright and her cheeks glowed, but she knew nothing about it. She was thinking only of the last half hour, and as they passed to their seats, her mind took a hasty range over it. His choice of subjects, his expressions, and still more his manner and look had been such as she could see in only one light. His opinion of Louisa Musgrove's inferiority, an opinion which he had seemed solicitous to give, his wonder at Captain Benwick, his feelings as to a first strong attachment, sentences begun which he could not finish, his half-averted eyes, and more than half-expressive glance, all, all declared that he had a heart returning to her at least, that anger, resentment, avoidance were no more, and that they were succeeded not merely by friendship and regard, but by the tenderness of the past. Yes, some share of the tenderness of the past. She could not contemplate the chain, change as implying less. He must love her. These were thoughts with their attendant visions, which occupied and flurried her too much to leave her any power of observation. And she passed along the room without having a glimpse of him, without even trying to discern him. When their places were determined on, and they were all properly arranged, she looked around to see if he should happen to be in the same part of the room, but he was not. Her eye could not reach him. And the concert being just opening, she must consent for a time to be happy in an humbler way. The party was divided and disposed of on two contiguous benches. Anne was among those on the foremost, and Mr. Elliot had maneuvered so well, with the assistance of his friend Colonel Wallace, as to have a seat by her. Miss Elliot, Surrounded by her cousins and the principal object of Colonel Wallace's gallantry, was quite contented. Anne's mind was in a most favorable state for the entertainment of the evening. It was just occupation enough. She had feelings for the tender, spirits for the gay, 
attention for the scientific, and patience for the wearisome. And had never liked a concert better, at least during the first act. Towards the close of it, in the interval succeeding an Italian song, she explained the words of the song to Mr. Elliot. They had a concert bill between them. This, said she, is merely the sense, or rather the meaning of the words, for certainly the sense of an Italian love song must not be talked of, <laughs> but it is as nearly the meaning as I can give, for I do not pretend to understand the language. I am a very poor Italian scholar. Yes, yes, I see you are. <laughs> I see you know nothing of the matter. You have only knowledge enough of the language to translate at sight these introverted, transposed, curtailed Italian lines into clear, comprehensible, elegant English. You need not say anything more of your ignorance. Here is complete proof. <laughs> I will not oppose such kind politeness, but I should be sorry to be examined by a real proficient. I have not had the pleasure of visiting in Candor Place so long, replied he without knowing something of Miss Anne Elliot, and I do regard her as one who is too modest for the world in general to be aware of half her accomplishments and too highly accomplished for modesty to be natural in any other woman. For shame, for shame, this is too much of flattery. I forget what we are to have next, turning to the bill. Perhaps, said Miss Elliot, speaking low, I have had a longer acquaintance with your character than you are aware of. Indeed, how so? You can have been acquainted with it only since I came to Bath, excepting as you might hear me previously spoken of in my own family. I knew you by report long before you came to Bath. I have heard you described by those who knew you intimately. I have been acquainted with you by character many years. Your person, your disposition, accomplishments, manner, they were all described. They were all present to me. Mr. Elliot was not disappointed in the interest he hoped to raise. No one can withstand the charm of such a mystery. To have been described long ago to a recent acquaintance by nameless people, is irresistible. And Anne was all curiosity. She wondered and questioned him eagerly, but in vain. He delighted in being asked, but he would not tell. No, no, sometime or other perhaps, but not now. He would mention no names now, but such he could assure you had been the fact. He had many years ago received such a description of Miss Anne Elliot as had inspired him with the highest idea of her merit and excited the warmest curiosity to know her. Anne could think of no one so likely to have spoken with partiality of her many years ago as the Mr. Wentworth of Monkford, Captain Wentworth's brother. He might have been in Mr. Elliot's company, but she had not courage to ask the question. The name of Anne Elliot, said he, has long had an interesting sound to me. Very long has it possessed a charm over my fancy. And if I dared, I would breathe my wishes that the name might never change. Such she believed were his words, but scarcely had she received their sound that her attention was caught by other sounds immediately behind her, which rendered everything else trivial. Her father and Lady Dalrymple were speaking. A well-looking man, said Sir Walter, a very well-looking man. A very fine young man indeed, said Lady Dalrymple, more air than one often sees in Bath. Irish, I dare say. No, I just know his name. A bowing acquaintance. Wentworth, Captain Wentworth of the Navy. His sister married my tenant in Somersetshire, the Croft, who rents Kellynch. 
Before Sir Walter had reached this point, Anne's eyes had caught the, sight, caught the right direction and distinguished Captain Wentworth, standing among a cluster of men at a little, a little distance. As her eyes fell on him, his seemed to be withdrawn from her. It had that appearance. It seemed as if she had been one moment too late. And as long as she dared observe, he did not look again. But the performance were recommencing, and she was forced to seem to restore her attention to the orchestra and look straight forward. When she could give another glance, he had moved away. He could not have come nearer to her if he would. She was so surrounded and shut in, but she would rather have caught his eye. Mr. Elliot's speech, too, distressed her. She had no longer any inclination to talk to him. She wished him not so near her. The first act was over. Now she hoped for some beneficial change. And after a period of nothing saying amongst the party, some of them did decide on going in quest of tea. Anne was one of the few who did not choose to move. She remained in her seat, and so did Lady Russell but she had the pleasure of getting rid of Mr. Elliot. And she did not mean, whatever she might feel on Lady Russell's account, to shrink from conversation with Captain Wentworth if he gave her the opportunity. She was persuaded by Lady Russell's countenance that she had seen him. He did not come, however. Anne sometimes fancied she discerned him at a distance but he never came. The anxious interval wore away unproductively. The others returned. The room filled again. Benches were reclaimed and repossessed, and another hour of pleasure or of penance was to be set out. Another hour of music was to give delight or the gapes, as real or unaffected or affected taste for it prevailed. To Anne, it chiefly wore the prospect of an hour of agitation. She could not quit that room in peace without seeing Captain Wentworth once more, without the interchange of one friendly look. In resettling themselves, there were now many changes, the result of which was favorable for her. Colonel Wallace declined sitting down again, and Mr. Elliot was invited by Elizabeth and Miss Carteret in a manner not to be refused, to sit between them. And by some other removals and a little scheming of her own, Anne was enabled to place herself much nearer the end of the bench than she had been before, much more within reach of a passerby. She could not do so without comparing herself with Miss LaRolles, the inimitable Miss LaRolles. But still, she did it, and not with much happier effect though by what seemed prosperity in the shape of an early abdication in her next neighbors, she found herself at the very end of the bench before the concert closed. Such was her situation with a vacant space at hand when Captain Wentworth was again in sight. She saw him not far off. He saw her too. Yet he looked grave and seemed irresolute and only by very slow degrees came at last near enough to speak to her. She felt that something must be the matter. The change was indubitable. The difference between his present air and what it had been in the octagon room was strikingly great. Why was it? She thought of her father, of Lady Russell. Could there have been any unpleasant glances? He began by speaking of the concert gravely, more like the Captain Wentworth of Uppercross, owned himself disappointed, had expected better singing, and in short, must confess that he should not be sorry when it was over. Anne replied and spoke in defense of the performance so well, and yet in allowance for his feelings so pleasantly that his countenance improved, and he replied again with almost a smile. They talked for a few minutes more, the improvement held. He even looked down towards the bench, 
as if you saw a place on it well worth occupying, when, at that moment, a touch on her shoulder obliged Anne to turn round. It came from Mr. Elliot. He begged her pardon, but she must be applied to, to explain Italian again. Miss Carteret was very anxious to have a general idea of what was next to be sung. Anne could not refuse, but never had she sacrificed to politeness with a more suffering spirit. A few minutes, though as few as possible, were inevitably consumed, and when her own mistress again, when able to turn and look as she had done before, she found herself accosted by Captain Wentworth in a reserved yet hurried sort of farewell. He must wish her good night. He was going. He should get home as fast as he could. Is not this song worth staying for? said Anne suddenly struck by an idea which made her yet more anxious to be encouraging. No, he replied impressively, there is nothing worth my staying for. And he was gone directly. Jealousy of Mr. Elliot. It was the only intelligible motive. Captain Wentworth, jealous of her affection. Could she have believed it a week ago? three hours ago. For a moment, the gratification was exquisite. But alas, there were very different thoughts to succeed. How was such jealousy to be quieted? How was the truth to reach him? How, in all the pe peculiar disadvantages of their respective situations, would he ever learn her real sentiments? It was misery to think of Mr. Elliot's attentions. Their evil was incalculable. Anne recollected with pleasure the next morning her promise of going to Mrs. Smith, meaning that it should engage her from home at the time when Mr. Elliot would be most likely to call. For to avoid Mr. Elliot was almost a first object. She felt a great deal of goodwill towards him. In spite of the mischief of his attentions, she owed him gratitude and regard, perhaps compassion. She could not help thinking much of the extraordinary circumstances attending their acquaintance, of the right which he seemed to have to interest her by everything in situation, by his own sentiments, by his early prepossession. It was altogether very extraordinary. Flattering, but painful. There was much to regret. How she might have felt had there been no Captain Wentworth in the case was not worth inquiry, for there was a Captain Wentworth. And be the conclusion of the present suspense good or bad, her affection would be his forever. Their union, she believed, could not divide her more from other men than their final separation. Pretty amusings of high-wrought love and eternal constancy could never have passed along the streets of Bath than Anne was sporting with from Camden Place to Westgate Buildings. It was almost enough to spread purification and perfume along the way. She was sure of a pleasant reception and her friend seemed this morning particularly obliged to her for coming, seemed hardly to have expected her, though it had been an appointment. An account of the concert was immediately claimed, and Anne's recollections of the concert were quite happy enough to animate her features and make her rejoice to talk of it. All that she could tell, she told most gladly, but the all was little for one who had been there and unsatisfactory for such an inquirer as Mrs. Smith, who had already heard, through the short end of a laundress and a waiter, rather more of the general success and produce of the evening than Anne could relate, and who now asked in vain for several particulars of the company. Everybody of any consequence or notoriety in Bath was well known by name to Mrs. Smith. The little Durands were there, I conclude, said she, 
with their mouths open to catch the music, like unfledged sparrows ready to be fed. They never miss a concert. Yes, I did not see them myself, but I heard Mr. Elliot say they were in the room. The Ibbotsons, were they there? And the two new beauties with the tall Irish officer who is talked of for one of them. I do not know, I do not think they were. Old Lady Mary McLean, I need not ask after her. She never misses, I know, and you must have seen her. She must have been in your own circle, for as you went with Lady Dalrymple, you were in the seats of grandeur round the orchestra, of course. No, that was what I dreaded. It would have been very unpleasant to me in every respect. But happily, Lady Dalrymple always chooses to be farther off, and we were exceedingly well placed. That is for hearing. I must not say for seeing, because I seem to I appear to have seen very little. Oh, you saw enough for your own amusement. I can understand. There was a sort of domestic enjoyment to be known even in a crowd, and this you had. You were in a large party in yourselves, and you wanted nothing beyond. But I ought to have looked about me more, said Anne, conscious while she spoke that there had in fact been no want of looking about, that the object only had been deficient. No, no. You were better employed. You need not tell me how you had a pleasant, that you had a pleasant evening. I see it in your eye. I perfectly see how the hours passed, that you had always something agreeable to listen to. In the intervals of the concert, it was conversation. Anne half smiled and said, do you see that in my eye? Yes, I do. Your countenance perfectly informs me that you were in company last night with the person whom you think the most agreeable in the world the person who interests you at this present time more than all the rest of the world put together. A blush overspread Anne's cheeks. She could say nothing. And such being the case, continued Mrs. Smith after a short pause, I hope you believe that I do know how to value your kindness in coming to see me this morning. It is really very good of you to come and sit with me when you must have so many pleasant demands upon your time. Anne heard nothing of this. She was still in the astonishment and confusion excited by her friend's penetration, unable to, unable to imagine how any report of Captain Wentworth could have reached her. After another short silence, pray, said Mrs. Smith, is Mr. Elliot aware of your acquaintance with me? Does he know that I am in Bath? Mr. Elliot, repeated Anne, looking up surprised. A moment's reflection showed her the mistake she had been under. She caught it instantaneously, and recovering courage with a feeling of safety, soon added more composedly, Are you acquainted with Mr. Elliot? I have been a good deal acquainted with him, replied Mrs. Smith gravely but it seems worn out now. It is a great while since we met. I was not at all aware of this. You never mentioned it before. Had I known it, I would have had the pleasure of talking to him about you. To confess the truth, said Mrs. Smith, assuming her usual air of cheerfulness, that is exactly the pleasure I want you to have. I want you to talk about me to Mr. Elliot. I want your interest with him. He can be of essential service to me. And if you would have the goodness, my dear Miss Elliot, to make it an object to yourself, of course it is done. I should be extremely happy. I hope you cannot doubt my willingness to be of even the slightest use to you, replied Anne. But I suspect that you are considering me as having a higher claim on Mr. Elliot a greater claim to influence him than is really the case. I'm sure you have somehow or other imbibed such a notion. You must consider me only as Mr. Elliot's relation. If in that light, if there is anything which you suppose his 
cousin might fairly ask of him, I beg you would not hesitate to employ me. Mrs. Smith gave her a penetrating glance and then smiling said, I have been a little premature, I perceive. I beg your pardon. I ought to have waited for official information. But now, my dear Miss Elliot, as an old friend, do give me a hint of as to when I may speak. Next week? To be sure, by next week I may be allowed to think it all settled and build my own selfish schemes on Mr. Elliot's good fortune. No, replied Anne. Not next week, nor next, nor next. I assure you that nothing of the sort you are thinking of will be settled any week. I am not going to marry Mr. Elliot. I should like to know why you imagine I am. Mrs. Smith looked at her again, looked earnestly, smiled, shook her head and exclaimed, now, how I do wish I understood you. How I do wish I knew what you were at. I have a great idea that you not, do not design to be cruel when the right moment comes. Till it does come, you know, we women never, re never mean to have anybody. It is a thing, of course, among us that every man is refused till he offers. But why should you be cruel? Let me plead for my present friend, I cannot call him, but for my former friend. Where can you look for a more suitable match? Where could you expect a more gentlemanlike, agreeable man? Let me recommend Mr. Elliot. I am sure you hear nothing but good of him from Colonel Wallace, and who can know him better than Colonel Wallace? My dear Mrs. Smith, Mr. Elliot's wife has not been dead much above half a year. He ought not to be supposed to be paying his addresses to anyone. Oh, if these are your only objections, cried Mrs. Smith archly, Mr. Elliot is safe, and I shall give myself no more trouble about him. Do not forget me when you are married, that's all. Let him know me to be a friend of yours, and then he will think little of the trouble required which is very natural for him now, with so many affairs and engagements of his own, to avoid and get rid of as he can. Very natural, perhaps. Ninety-nine out of a hundred would do the same. Of course, he cannot be aware of the importance to me. Well, my dear Miss Elliot, I hope and trust you'll be very happy. Mr. Elliot has sense to understand the value of such a woman. Your peace will not be shipwrecked as mine has been. You are safe in all worldly matters and safe in his character. He will not be led astray. He will not be misled by others to his ruin. No, said Anne, I can readily believe all that of my cousin. He seems to have a calm, decided temper, not at all open to dangerous impressions. I consider him with great respect. I have no reason from anything that has fallen within my observation to do otherwise. But I have not known him long, and he is not a man, I think, to be known intimately soon. Will not this manner of speaking of him, Mrs. Smith, convince you that he is nothing to me? Surely this must be calm enough, and upon my word he is nothing to me. Surely this must be calm enough. Should he ever propose to me, which I have very little reason to imagine he has any thought of doing, I shall not accept him. I assure you, I shall not. I assure you, Mr. Elliot had not the share which you have been supposing in whatever pleasure the concert of last night might afford. Not Mr. Elliot. It is not Mr. Elliot that... She stopped, regretting with a, regretting with a deep blush that she had implied so much, but less would hardly have been sufficient. Mrs. Smith would hardly have believed so soon in Mr. Elliot's failure, but for the perception of there being a somebody else. As it was, she instantly submitted, and with all the semblance of seeing nothing beyond, 
And Anne, eager to escape further notice, was impatient to know why Mrs. Smith should have fancied she was to marry Mr. Elliot, where she could have received the idea, or from whom she could have heard it. Do tell me how it first came into your head. It first came into my head, replied Mrs. Smith, upon finding how much you were together, and feeling it to be the most probable thing in the world to be wished for by everybody belonging to either of you. And you may depend upon it that all your acquaintance have disposed of you in the same way. But I never heard it spoken of till two days ago. And has it indeed been spoken of? Did you observe the woman who opened the door to you when you called yesterday? No. Was it not Mrs. Speed, as usual, or the maid? I observed no one in particular. It was my friend, Mrs. Rook, Nurse Rook, who, by the way, had a great curiosity to see you and was delighted to be in the way to let you in. She came away from Marlborough Buildings only on Sunday, and she it was who told me you were to marry Mr. Elliot. She had it from Mrs. Wallace herself, which did not seem bad authority. She sat an hour with me on Monday evening and gave me the whole history. The whole history, repeated Anne, laughing. She could not make a very long history, I think, of one such little article of unfounded news. Mrs. Smith said nothing. But, continued Anne presently, though there is no truth in my having this claim on Mr. Elliot, I should be extremely happy to be of use to you in any way that I could. Shall I mention to him your being in Bath? Shall I take any message? No, I thank you. Certainly not. In the warmth of the moment, and under a mistaken impression, I might perhaps have endeavored to interest you in some circumstances, but not now. No, I thank you. I have nothing to trouble you with. I think you spoke of having known Mr. Elliot many years. I did. Not before he married, I suppose. Yes, he was not married when I knew him first. And were you much acquainted? Intimately. Indeed. Then do tell me what he was at that time of life. I have a great curiosity to know what Mr. Elliot was as a very young man. Was he at all such as he appears now? I have not seen Mr. Elliot these three years, was Mrs. Smith's answer, given so gravely that it was impossible to pursue the subject farther. And Anne felt that she had gained nothing but an increase of curiosity. They were both silent. Mrs. Smith, very thoughtful. At last, I beg your pardon, my dear Miss Elliot, she cried in her natural tone of cordiality. I beg your pardon for the short answers I have been giving you, but I have been uncertain what I ought to do. I have been doubting and considering as to what I ought to tell you. There are many things to be taken into the account. One hates to be officious, to be giving bad impressions, making mischief. Even the smooth surface of family union seems worth preserving, though there may be nothing durable beneath. However, I am determined. I think I am right. I think you ought to be made acquainted, acquainted with Mr. Elliot's real character. Though I fully believe that at present you have not the smallest intention of accepting him, there is no saying which, what may happen. You might, some time or other, be differently affected towards him. Hear the truth, therefore, now, while you are unprejudiced. Mr. Elliot is a man without heart or conscience, a designing, wary, wary, cold-blooded being who thinks only of himself, who for his own interest or ease would be guilty of any cruelty, of any treachery that could be perpetrated without risk of his general character. He has no feeling for others, 
those whom he has been the chief cause of bleeding into ruin, he can neglect and desert without the smallest compassion. He is totally beyond the reach of any sentiment of justice or compassion. Oh, he is black at heart, hollow and black. Well, now, what will be revealed about Mr. Elliot, and how will it affect our story? Tune in next week to Tales and Cocktails as we go forward. We're on the home stretch now. And that is part 10 of Tales and Cocktails. My dears, I look forward to seeing you next week, for we will continue with part 11 of Tales and Cocktails. Part 11 of, of Persuasion by Jane Austen on Tales and Cocktails. Take care, and those of you in Florida, please take very great care. This is a stinker, this hurricane that's heading towards you. Yeah, and even here, the sky is very overcast, so this is a very difficult hurricane. Please be very careful, all of you. Good night, my dears.